اوكي اوكي شكرا جزيلا ثانك يو سو ماتش فور انفايتينغ مي تو بريزنت ماي ماي توك اباوت ام ار اي ايميجينج اوف سبورت انجريز سو اي هاف نو كونفليكت اوف انتريست um the theme of the talk is really to provide some basic information about mri imaging for musculoskeletal injuries we'll talk about mri protocols scanners coils and specific imaging techniques such as positioning we'll also cover some pictorial uh, images uh, pictorial review of musculoskeletal injuries as related to all the musculoskeletal structures as listed down here Uh, will provide basic definition and terminology for describing musculoskeletal injuries. I will also cover some MRI pitfalls, so then we avoid overcalling uh, pathologies. Um, background about uh, sport injuries and musculoskeletal imaging. Sports and exercise are very important for physical and mental health, as I'm sure you know that. Uh, sport injuries are the byproduct of busy, being physically active. Um, on average, about 2.6 million emergency visitors are related to sport injuries particularly um, age population between 5 and 24 years old um mri imaging technique what well, uh, this is what really the information i'm providing you is what we have here in canada um, i'm sure every center is different and you have your own techniques and you have your own protocol i'm just sharing with you what we do here in canada and how we image uh, musculoskeletal injuries Uh, I will talk about the scanners we have, the coils, how we use the coils and sequences. I uh, will talk about positioning and MRI planes. Uh, for the uh, MRI scanners, we generally in our center, we have the 1.5 and 3 Tesla scanners. Uh, we always, it would be a good idea to have two scanners at your facility of different strength. Definitely 1.5 Tesla scanner is your basic MRI scanner that you should have it in all your uh, centers. Um, the advantages for having three Tesla scanner is because of the better signal to noise ratio and because it has a wider bore you could actually fit in a bigger patients the disadvantages for having three Tesla scanner is the fact that all mri artifacts are exaggerated on the three Tesla scanner um, and because of that having a 1.5 Tesla scanner is advantageous because if you have patients with the hardware or metal and in musculoskeletal patients, we see a lot of patients with uh, metal uh, implantation. And because of that, we prefer to image these patients using the 1.5 Tesla scanner. And obviously the disadvantage of having the 1.5 Tesla scanner is the inferior signal to noise ratio compared to three Tesla scanner. Um, the coils, um, generally what we have at our center, we have joint specific coils and we have body coils. The joint specific coils are specific for the uh, for each joint shoulder knee hand and ankle foot and ankle um, advantages for having joint specific coils is because they provide um, a higher signal to noise ratio and higher resolution the disadvantage obviously for using joint specific coils is the small field of view and if you had a patient with a pathology that involves a larger field of view such as for example a hamstring muscle injury then it would be a good idea to use a body coil because that will cover cover a large area of field of view the problem with body coils however is the inferior signal to noise ratio compared to joint specific coils um, the sequences we use in musculoskeletal injuries we always have uh, fluid sensitive fat saturated sequences and you could either use the T2 fat saturated sequence or use the stair sequence. Now, these are two different uh, imaging techniques and two different sequences from MRI physics. I'm sure you remember that fat saturation um, is an imaging technique that relies on using frequency selection. And because it is utilizing frequency selection, it provides better signal to noise ratio uh, than stair sequence and therefore shorter scan time. The disadvantage for the T2 fat saturated sequence is the fact that if there is inhomogeneity of the magnetic field, um, the fat saturation will fail. And you see these circumstances in patients with uh, either hardware or complex air soft tissue interface, such as around the foot and ankle, where in these circumstances, the fat saturation fails. And when you have failure of fat saturation, we always take, tell our um, MRI technologies to switch from 
uh, T2 fat saturation to a STIR inversion recovery sequence because that's a different principle. And because it's inversion recovery sequence, although it overcomes the inhomogeneity problem that you see with the T2 fat saturated sequence, the problem with the STIR sequence is the longer scan time. And the longer scan time happens because um, STIR sequence has a, an inferior signal to noise ratio compared to T2FS. And because of that, you have to increase the number of excitation. Uh, and increasing number of excitation means longer scan time. And longer scan time, as I'm sure you know, means patient fatigue and motion artifact. Here we have two examples of patient, same patient actually, who underwent T2 fat saturation fat sequence here on the left side and STIR sequence here on the right side. You see the inhomogeneity of the magnetic field and failure of fat saturation. But when you switch to STIR sequence, then you overcome that problem. Um, the planes we use for musculoskeletal injuries, axial plane is always mandatory. So in all musculoskeletal injuries, we always have axial plane. The second orthogonal plane could be sagittal or coronal, depending on where the pathology is in the extremity. If the pathology is anterior or posterior, we use a sagittal plane. If the pathology is medial or lateral, then we use a coronal plane. Uh, my advice here in, in Canada, in our center, always when I teach the residents, is always to uh, advise to uh, the technologist to place a skin marker where the pathology is. Because sometimes when the injury is chronic and there is no fluid at the site of injury, it's really difficult to find where the tear is or the muscle injury is. So having a, a skin marker at the site of injury is always helpful. Um, now we move on to the spectrum of sports injuries, which is the core of this talk, and start with muscle injuries. Um, um, before I start with uh, describing all the muscle injuries, uh, the way we image muscles here in our center is really basic MRI protocol. There's nothing complicated about it. Uh, we use uh, the fluid-sensitive fat-saturated sequences in two-plane axial and second orthogonal plane, could be coronal or SAG, and we have a T1 also on two planes, axial and second orthogonal plane could be coronal or sag. We don't routinely give uh, contra uh, contrast or gadolinium for patients with muscle injuries. We only give gadolinium if there is suspicion of a tumor versus hematoma. Then in these circumstances, we give contrast, but otherwise we don't. The spectrum of muscle injuries ranges from myotendinous tears, myofascial tears, muscle contusion, and muscle hernia, and we'll see examples of these. Um, before that, I would rather just mention a little bit about muscle physiology uh, because it really relates to how muscle injuries take place. Uh, so there are three types of muscle contractions, uh, as I'm sure you know. The isometric uh, contraction is uh, muscle contraction with no change in length. Concentric contraction is contraction with shortening of the muscle. Eccentric contraction is contraction with lengthening of the muscle. The extrinsic, extrinsic contraction is actually the one that puts the muscle at higher risk for muscle tear. So we see this quite often in sports or athletes because of the eccentric uh, type of muscle contraction. There's also anatomic consideration to bear in mind when uh, we uh, talk about muscle injuries, and that relates to a certain group of muscles. We call them the biarticular muscles. And what that means is the muscle crossing two joints. And these muscles that cross two joints are at higher risk of muscle tears. And this includes the biceps, uh, rectus femoris, hamstring, gastrocnemius, and aliasoas muscles. All of these um, suffer muscle injuries because of the anatomy of these muscles. There's another unique uh, anatomic consideration about muscles is what we call muscle pination. And muscle pination means how many tendons within the muscle itself. The muscle could have one tendon and we call it unipinate muscle or the muscle could have two tendons, we call it bipinate muscle, and uh, a tendon could have multiple tendons, we call it multipinate muscle. And why this is important is because the type or the pattern or MRI appearances of muscle injuries will vary depending on the muscle pination. So for example, here with the image on the left, we have uh, um, an image uh, about a patient who suffered rectus femoris muscle injury. And because it's a unipinate muscle, sorry, pipinate muscle, we see the halo of muscle edema around the myotendinous junction. But in a, a unipinate muscle, and this is in this patient with a semimembranosus injury, we see the tear and fluid filled cleft is rather peripheral. Uh, 
so this is how uh, we would uh, describe these uh, appearances based on the muscle pronation. Uh, move on to grading of the muscles, uh, muscle injuries. There's a clinical grading and MRI grading. Uh, focusing on the MRI grading, grade one, when there's just edema, no muscle disruption. Grade two, there is muscle disruption, but uh, uh, more than 5%. Uh, and grade three is complete muscle tear. This basically, this grading system is only for acute muscle tears. For chronic muscle tears, you don't really see these changes. All what you see is muscle atrophy with fatty infiltration. Um, the grade one muscle injury is, this is how it looks like. You only see muscle, diffuse muscle edema uh, and edema around the, uh, around the tendons, such as here in patient with injuries, grade one injuries involving the tensor fascia lata and the rectus femoris muscle. Um, so here, this, this, is, uh, this is just edema with no muscle disruption. And the grade two here, we see in patient with a grade two injury of the aliosaurus tendon on the right side. We see the edema here in the muscle, which is really rather long on the sagittal plane. Um, and this is a grade two injury because there is disruption of the muscle fibers here. And studies have shown that the length of the muscle tear is more important than the width of the muscle tear as far as patient recovery and return to sport is. So always we would measure the length of the tear of the muscle tear and have more emphasis on this rather than the width of the tear. And grade th uh, three um, injury of the muscle is basically complete tear of the, uh, of the tendon, such as in this patient with proximal hamstring muscle injury. There's complete detachment of the tendon from the ischial tuberosity with a fluid filled uh, gap here. So this is type three muscle injury or grade three muscle injury. Um, here we have another example of grade three muscle injury involving the medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. You see that the tear is quite long and involves the entire proximal myotendinous junction. Myofascial tears are different to myotendinous tears. So what we saw so far were, were the cases we looked at were all myotendinous tears. But there's a different pattern of muscle injury. We call it myofascial tears. And this myofascial fascial tears happen between the muscle and the fascia. So it's not central around the myotendinous junction, but it's actually peripheral between the muscle and the fascia. And what you get is detachment of the muscle from the fascial layer. And this is called myofascial injury, as in this patient with passitus lateralis myofascial tear. Another pattern of muscle injury is the, um, uh, is the uh, muscle hernia. And muscle hernia happens due to tears involving the epimysium that surrounds the muscle. And we see muscle hernia here involving the extensor compartment of the, um, uh, of the leg. Uh, and when we do the MRI scan on these patients with suspected muscle hernia, we do the MRI in a contraction and relaxation. And then we measure and compare the muscle uh, on, both, uh, on both phases of muscle contraction. Um, I per personally prefer to do ultrasound scan on these patients, but sometimes they get referred for MRI scan because of suspicion of soft tissue tumor. Um, so when they get an MRI scan, it's really to rule out a tumor, but accidentally we find a muscle hernia rather than a muscle tear, uh, rather than a, a soft tissue tumor. Uh, I prefer the ultrasound, doing the ultrasound in dynamic examination is more helpful uh, from my experience. Um, the um, the chronic muscle injuries, as I mentioned earlier, is you don't really see all the changes we talked about, about muscle uh, edema or uh, the fluid cleft. What you see with the chronic muscle tears is just muscle atrophy with fatty infiltration, as we can see here in this patient with right rectus femoris chronic tear. We just see um, uh, fat infiltration of the muscle. There's pitfall related to muscle injuries and it's related to the edema of the muscle. Uh, so I'm sure you are aware that magic angle effect is a problem with tendons, but uh, bear in mind that magic angle effect can be also a problem with muscles, especially, especially certain type of muscles so that we call them the parallel fibers muscles. And examples for these muscles is the thinner compartment and a pronator quadratus. So when you see edema in these muscles, it's not necessarily muscle injury or muscle tear, it's just a magic angle effect. 
Okay, we're done with muscle injuries, move on to tendon injuries. Um, and with tendons, uh, we need to understand how normal tendons look like. And normal tendons look uh, homogeneously hypointense on all the uh, pulse sequences. The best imaging technique for tendon imaging is uh, utilizing the proton density fat saturated sequence T1 and T2. T2 should always be included in your MRI protocol. From my experience, it helps mitigate the magic angle effect that you see with, uh, with the proton density fat saturated sequence. And with uh, positioning is uh, also an important factor uh, with the tendon imaging. For the shoulder, we always have the shoulder in extension. And the reason why is because external rotation of the shoulder joint uh, avoids magic angle effect, um, a problem with the supraspinatus tendon. Also positioning is important for imaging the distal biceps tendon. We use the FAPS technique or FAPS positioning, which is flexion, abduction, supination, as in these images here, uh, which uh, really pr provides uh, a very optimum definition and depiction of the distal biceps tendon. Um, there are tendons that have surgical implications and therefore uh, describing the tears um, accurately is very important. And these muscles uh, with surgical implications, the rotator cuff tendons, Achilles tendon, quadriceps, patellar tendon, and distal biceps tendons. Normally when there is tear in these tendons, they always end up having surgical intervention for tendon repair. Pattern of patterns, different patterns of injuries involved in, involving the tendons uh, range from tendinosis, which is just a repetitive stress injury, uh, to partial thickness tears and full thickness tears. Uh, the protocol, uh, I, I, I use the shoulder joint here for, uh, as an example for tendon tears because we uh, always um, have a problem uh, with patient coming with a rotator cuff injuries. This is basically our MRI protocol. I just wanted to share it with you, just an opportunity uh, for us to exchange our experiences. This is how we image the shoulder joint in our center. We use um, proton density sequences in three planes. In the XL, coronal, and sagittal, we have coronal T2 sequence, we have sagittal T1, and we have uh, axial gradient acromedic sequence. So this is our shoulder protocol in our center. The reason why we have T1 sag, for example, here is because we use it to quantify the muscle wasting, muscle atrophy, and we use the gutile air system for quantifying uh, fatty infiltration of the muscle. Uh, we use the coronal T2 and coronal PDFS side by side uh, because um, we detect muscle or rotator cuff tendon tears here on the coronal um, and sagittal PDFS. We use the coronal T2 in order to make sure that the problem in the tendon is not a magic angle effect. Supraspinatus tendinosis. This is an example how supraspinatus tendinosis looks like. Uh, so I will put the normal side by side. This is how a normal supraspinatus tendon looks like, homogeneously hypointense. In this patient with tendinosis, we see that there is um, um, increased signal intensity or signal change uh, of the tendon, uh, which is matching between the coronal PDFS here and the coronal T2. So this would be in keeping with supraspinatus tendinosis. And uh, we don't use the term tendinitis anymore because there's no inflammation Histopathologically, there's no inflammation in the tendon, so it's an obsolete term. Um, the second pattern of tendon injury is partial thickness tearing, and we have again images the coronal PDFS and the coronal T2 side by side. Uh, we see focal defect hyper intense area here at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon, which is matching with the coronal T2. So that matching means it's actually a tear, not a magic angle effect. So this is partial thickness articular sided tear at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. Another pattern of tendon injury is complete for thickness tear with tendon retraction. Here, supraspinatus tendon completely retracted and detached from the greater tuberosity. And what we're seeing is a fluid filled gap here. And again, we see the gap on the coronal T2. So every time you look at pathology in the supraspinatus tendon on the coronal PDFS, always look at the coronal T2 to make sure that what he's seeing is actually matching. And in this patient, because there is complete full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon with tendon retraction, uh, 
you see there is muscle atrophy. We use a technique called the tangent line technique between the superior aspect of the coracoid process, superior aspect of the spinous process. We draw a line and then we assess how the supraspinatus looks like. It should normally about 30% of the muscle should be above this tangent line. And what we're seeing here is just a tiny bit of the muscle above the tangent line. So this is a mild to moderate atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle. We also use this to quantify the fatty infiltration. And these are important for surgical repair. And our center surgeons don't repair supraspinatus tendon tears if there is evidence of muscle atrophy or fatty infiltration because the muscle is not considered viable for surgical repair. Um, magic angle effect, as I mentioned earlier, is a problem with supraspinatus tendon here. We have a good example of magic angle effect. We sig signal change here in the supraspinatus tendon on the coronal PDFS, but it's not there on the coronal T2. So this is just a false uh, or artifact. Move on to ligamentous injuries. Um, I use the knee joint for ligamentous injuries because we have four important ligaments in the knee joints and they are important for uh, stabilizing the knee joint. By the way, we, it's, it's really important to mention here, when I talked about tendons, I, I, um, I used the rotator cuff tendons uh, as an example for tendon tears because the major stabilizers of the shoulder joints are the tendons. However, in the knee joint, the major stabilizers of the knee joints are the ligaments. So I use the knee joints as an example for ligamentous injuries because they are the major stabilizers of the knee joint. Um, when we talk about ligamentous injuries in the knee, it would be helpful to remember the mechanism of injury provided. Um, if the surgeon or the referent physician is providing you with the mechanism of injury is very helpful uh, because, um, the, for example, if, if a patient suffered pivot shift mechanism of injury, then we always suspect either anterior cruciate ligament tear or medial collateral ligament tear. If patient provided a history of hyperextension mechanism of injury, then we suspect ACL and PCL tears, valgus mechanism of injury, normally associated with medial collateral ligament tears, varus mechanism of injury associated with lateral collateral ligament tears. So history is very important in, in terms of um, uh, uh, using that information for our MRI uh, diagnostic information. Um, ligamentous injuries, this is the protocol we use for, or the sequences we use for the uh, for the knee joint, we use uh, PDFS in three planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal planes. We use sagittal T1. Um, we use coronal PD space. I don't know if you have this technique or maybe using a similar technique. Uh, the, the essence for using the coronal PD space is really to provide isotropic imaging. And this isotropic imaging allows us to do multiplanar reconstruction uh, of the knee joint using the coronal PD space. Um, this is widely used here in North America. Um, so this is basically the MRI uh, protocol we, we use for, uh, for routine knee pathology. That The routine knee pathology means either meniscal tears, uh, ligamentous tears, or cartilage problems. Grading ligamentous injuries can be clinical or MRI-based. The MRI-based is very simple. Grade one, when there's edema, no disruption of the ligament. Grade two, when there's edema and partial tear. Grade three, when there is complete tear and detachment of the ligament. So this is basically the grading system we use for uh, ligamentous injuries. Here, how a normal um, medial collateral ligament, for example, here, medial collateral ligament looks um, uh, very linear, very hypointense with no surrounding edema no striation. So this is the normal appearance of the medial collateral ligament. Here we see grade one MCL sprain injury, although the MCL itself remains linear and hypointense, there is periligmentous edema around it. So this would be in keeping with grade one MCL sprain injury. There is also here a medial meniscal tear. Grade two um, MCL injury is when there is thickening striation and partial disruption of the femoral attachment of the medial collateral ligament. 
So this would be a type two or grade two um, sprain injury. Grade three is complete discontinuity and tear of the femoral attachment of the medial collateral ligament. The challenge with ligamentous injuries is when the tear or the injury is chronic, uh, because all what you see on the, uh, with these patients is actually thickening of the, uh, of the ligament with no surrounding edema, no striation. But the way you appreciate that is just by remembering how a normal ligament looks like. So for example, here I have the two images side by side for two different patients. This patient is a normal MCL. This patient is a chronic MCL sprain injury. And what do you see? It's just thickening of the MCL. We're done with the ligamentous injuries. Uh, now we move on to um, uh, cartilage injuries. Uh, are we okay with time? Uh, okay, cartilage injuries. Um, cartilage injuries, basically, histopathologically, we have uh, three types of uh, cartilage. Um, the, our focus is on the hyaline cartilage and fibro cartilage. Uh, the elastic cartilage is beyond the scope of this talk. Hyaline cartilage is um, um, an intermediate signal intensity um, layer that covers the articular surfaces, as we can see here in the coronal PD space and uh, coronal uh, PDFS. It presents as an intermediate signal intensity uh, covering the articular surfaces. Spectrum of uh, cartilage injuries include um, acute osteochondral fractures, acute osteochondral impaction injury, subchondral fractures, and osteochondritis desiccans. And we see examples of all of these. Acute osteochondral fracture injury, here's an example of 15-year-old patient who suffered lateral patellar dislocation. And what we see here is focal area of a sharply marginated osteochondral defect involving the anterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. We see here the uh, detached osteochondral fragment in the anterior aspect of the lateral tibiofemoral compartment. So this would be in keeping with an acute osteochondral fracture. And the way we know this is acute is because of the surrounding bony edema. This is important for the surgeons because uh, MRI here provides really valuable information for the surgeons because uh, surgeons in these circumstances would carry out a reimplantation of the osteochondral fragment and put it back to where it belongs. Um, Another pattern of cartilage injury is osteochondral uh, impaction injury. And osteochondral impaction injury presents as focal area of indentation or incongruency of the articular surface with no uh, fracture, with no detached or sharply delineated fracture fragment. So this is basically just uh, impaction injury of the cartilage that leaves a focal area of incongruency of the articular surface. And the way we detect it is by just appreciating that there is incongruency of the cartilage, there is um, hypo-intense um, uh, changes in the bone on the T1, and there is surrounding edema. Uh, sometimes you see joint diffusion as well. Um, so this is how typically uh, osteochondral impaction injuries look like. Another pattern of cartilage injury is the subchondral fracture. And this is how subchondral fracture looks like, is a kind of a crescentic hypo-intense line in the subarticular uh, cartilage of the lateral femoral condyle, uh, surrounded by, again, osseous edema. Uh, so this can be quite subtle sometimes and sometimes easy to miss, but these can be symptomatic and can be the only pathology uh, on the knee MRI scan. For example, in this patient, there is no meniscal tear. There are no uh, ligamentous injuries. Uh, all what this patient has is subchondral uh, fracture, and this can be painful and symptomatic for the patient. Another pattern of cartilage injury is osteochondritis desiccans. Osteochondritis desiccans, as uh, we see in this patient with Panner's disease of the capitellum, this patient is a gymnast, and because of uh, what they do, uh, there is quite repetitive axial loading of the upper extremity. And the repetitive axial loading of the upper extremity will lead to the osteochondritis 
uh, of the capitulum, we see there is an osteochondral fragment, which is fragmented and detached from the capitulum. There is joint diffusion and synovitis. Um, so this is another pattern of cartilage injury uh, demonstrated by osteochondritis of the capitulum. Um, move on from the hyaline cartilage to the fibrocartilage, and the fibrocartilage is present in the menisci, the labrum, and triangular fibrocartilage. Um, all these structures, because they are fibrocartilage in, in origin, they all appear hypo -intense, uh, homogeneously hypointense in signal intensity on all the pulse sequences. Um, and the best imaging technique for the fibrocartilage is using an MRI sequence with short TE. And the short TE sequences include uh, the proton density and the T1. So these are best sequences for imaging the fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage, as I mentioned, is present in the menisci and grading meniscal changes. Uh, grade zero is when the meniscus looks normal, homogeneously normal here on the coronal PDFS and coronal PD space with no focal defect, no fluid cleft, no signal change. This is grade zero. And grade one is when there is signal change within the body of the meniscus without, um, without uh, breach of the articular surface or without contact to the articular surface. So this would be type one signal change. Type two signal change is when there is linear fluid signal intensity within the substance of the meniscus. However, there is no breach of the articular surfaces. So this would be grade two meniscal change. Grade three meniscal change is the only one that is uh, that qualifies to be called meniscal tear. Uh, because in this, in this situation, the fluid filled cleft um, breaches the articular surfaces. And because it breaches the articular surfaces, then it qualifies to be a meniscal tear. And why this is important, because when surgeons carry out arthroscopy, uh, they, they, um, they will be looking for the meniscal tear. And if you, for example, someone called this as meniscal tear, when they go in and do arthroscopy, they don't really see the tear because the articular surface is intact. And same thing with type 2. If uh, this was overcalled as a meniscal tear, it may cause or may lead to false arthroscopy or negative arthroscopy where the surgeons don't see anything. So it's only this one that really qualifies to be called as meniscal tear. And when the tear is multidirectional, as in this patient, we see uh, multi-directional components to the tear, then this will be described as complex meniscal tear. Complex or sometimes even called as multi-directional meniscal tear. Another type or another tissue, uh, fibrocartilage tissue is the labrum. Uh, the labrum is present, as I'm sure you know that, uh, in the glenoid, in the acetabulum. And we published an article describing the labrum in the ankle joint and the posterior tibia. Uh, so this is new in the literature, but generally speaking, we see the labrum in the glenoid and in the acetabulum. When we image the glenoid labrum uh, at our center, we use arthroscopic technique, uh, sorry, arthrographic technique, and this can be done on the 1.5 or 3 Tesla uh, scanners. This is an example of the arthrographic MRI of the shoulder joint uh, with the intraarticular gadolinium. The labrum appears homogeneously hypointense on the uh, T1 fat saturated or the proton density fat saturated sequences. This is our MRI protocol for the shoulder MRI arthrography. We use uh, coronal T1 fat saturated. We use coronal T2 fat saturated, XLPD fat saturated, sagittal T1, and we use the ABR. I'm not sure if you use the ABR uh, for these patients. We always have the ABR position, which is abduction external rotation um, of the shoulder joint. Um, I think our time, maybe we have less than a minute. So maybe we go, what I was, uh, what I was talking about is uh, imaging the, um, the glenoid labrum. Uh, so I mentioned our MRI protocol for the glenoid uh, labrum, MRI arthrography. Um, I know in the literature that some centers have started doing non-arthrographic imaging of the uh, shoulder labrum, we have not really changed our protocol uh, 
we still do MRI arthrography for the glenoid labrum. Uh, so it may change in the future, uh, but you still have the option to do MRI arthrography. And I noticed this with the hip because um, we used to do MRI arthrography of the hip and then we changed to non-orthographic imaging of the hip. But some of the orthopedic surgeons still prefer to have uh, arthrographic technique of the, uh, of the hip joint. So although the shoulder may change in the future to non-orthographic technique, it would always be helpful to have your skills, uh, diagnostic skills available for uh, MRI arthrography of the shoulder joint. So here we have a patient with MRI arthrography of the shoulder joint. We see type two slap tear. Slap tear as a superior labral anteroposterior tear. So here's a slap two of the superior labrum. And here is the Aber position that I was talking about earlier, uh, which is abduction external rotation of the shoulder joint. Um, this is another example of uh, labral pathology in the glenoid. We call it Bancard lesion, and Bancard lesion is anterior inferior labral detachment with periosteal sleeve avulsion. So the this definition of this pathology is really important because. Uh, we would be able to use this definition to distinguish Bancard from other types of labral tears. So here, the chondrolabral tear of the um, of the anteroinferior labrum with periosteal sleeve avulsion. So it's very important to remember there is periosteal sleeve avulsion in Bancard lesion, and this is important because there is devascularization happens here. Uh, with the avulsion of the periosteal sleeve. This distinguish, uh, distinguishes um, Bancard lesion from ellipsa lesion, and ellipsa refers to anterior labral ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion. And uh, this is demonstrated by medialization of the anteroinferior labral fragment. However, the periosteal sleeve remains intact. So this is how we distinguish between ellipsa lesion and Bancart lesion. So the first thing is the medialization of the fragment, and the second thing is the periosteal sleeve itself remains intact. Another type of uh, enter of, uh, of the uh, glenoid labral pathology is Perthes disease or Perthes lesion. And Perthes lesion is labral ligamentous uh, chondrolabral tear of the anteroinferior labrum. However, there is no medialization of the labral fragment. So this, is, this distinguishes Perthes disease or Perthes lesion from ellipsa lesion. Both ellipsa lesion and Perthes lesion have intact periosteal sleeve. So they have one thing in common, which is the intact periosteal sleeve. However, Perthes lesion remains in its position with no medialization um, when, in, in contrast to what we see with uh, ellipsa lesion. Always remember that when we talk about labral tears, we should always be looking for paralabral cysts because these paralabral cysts could actually be problematic as in this patient. This patient has um, infraposterior labral tear, but developed a paralabral cyst. And this paralabral cyst now is situated in the quadrilateral space of the shoulder joint. And because we know that in the quadrilateral space, there is the axillary nerve, there is entrapment of the axillary nerve and there is denervation myositis of the teres minor and the deltoid muscle. So we always bear in mind that with labral tears, there could be paralabral cysts. Now, why this is important? Because um, arthroscopic surgeons will miss paralabral cysts. When they go in arthroscopically and explore the joint and explore the labrum, they will miss anything that lies extra articularly. Uh, and this is the advantage of MRI over arthroscopy. Uh, MRI is able to detect everything that happens around the shoulder joint, but arthroscopy is limited to all the changes within the shoulder joint itself. And if we point out to the surgeons that there is actually a paralabral cyst associated with the labral tear, then what they will do, they open the capsule and according to the clock phase, um, so in, in what we use here, we use the clock phase when we describe labral tears. Three o'clock is always anterior, nine o'clock is always posterior, 12 o'clock superior, six o'clock is inferior. So for example, if we told the surgeon there is a paralabral cyst uh, 
at seven o'clock position, then what they do is when they repair the labral tear, they open the capsule at seven o'clock position and decompress the cyst or remove it or ligate the neck of the cyst. So then there is no recurrence. So it's always important to mention this in the MRI report. Move on to the acetabular labrum. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we used to do um, a lot of MRI orthography of the acetabular labrum and we use the T1 fat saturated and PDFS uh, sequences for this MRI protocol. And this is an example of MRI arthrography of the, uh, of the hip joint. And we see the focal tear here in the anterosuperior labrum with contrast uh, migration into the labral tear substance itself. And this is how we see the fluid filled or contrast from the cleft within the labrum. So typically this is how uh, labral acetabular tear looks like. Uh, but gradually we moved on from uh, MRI arthrography of the hip joint to the non-arthrographic technique of the imaging of the acetabular labrum. This is a completely different technique and the problem with it, as I mentioned, that ortho, um, orth uh, orthopedic surgeons are not quite familiar with it and some of them still prefer MRI arthrography of the hip joint. But the non-arthrographic technique is really a good technique. Uh, however, you need to have a three Tesla scanner for this imaging technique. You cannot do it on the 1.5 Tesla scanner. So uh, on the three Tesla scanner, you will be able to do it. The sequences needed will include PDFS, the PD space for the isotropic imaging. So you can do multi, multiplanar reconstruction. And we do radial cuts. And this is an example of a radial cut. And radial cut is not a new technique, actually. When MRI was first invented, the radial cuts were used for imaging the menisci. Um, so this is an old technique, but has been uh, brought back into practice. And on this non-arthrographic imaging of the hip, we see there is a chondral labral defect here on the articular surface of the labrum. Uh, the structure lying over it here is at the alias of tendon. But you can see even without having to inject the hip joint with um, with gadolinium, we were able to detect chondrolabral tear here in this patient. Uh, the other fibrocartilaginous structure is the triangular fibrocartilage of the wrist. Um, and imaging the triangular fibrocartilage of the wrist in our center is always orthographic. So here we have an example of MRI orthography of the wrist joint with intraarticular gadolinium. Uh, and the triangular fibrocartilage is here. Uh, our sequence includes these, uh, sorry, our protocol includes these sequences uh, for MRI arthrography of the wrist joint. We have different MRI protocols for the wrist, but if the clinical question is triangular fiber cartilage tear, then the technique is always MRI arthrography. And as with the shoulder joint, some, uh, there's some evidence in the literature that um, uh, you could actually do it without having to inject the uh, wrist joint with gadolinium, but this is still an area of further research and exploration. Um, the grading system we use for the triangular fiber cartilage tear is the Palmer classification. Um, so the type one uh, tears are all traumatic, type two tears are all degenerate. And in this patient, we see type one A and type one B. Uh, tears of the triangular fiber cartilage. Another evidence for uh, triangular fiber cartilage tear is contrast extension from the wrist into the distal radial ulnar joint. So that's your evidence for triangular fiber cartilage tear. Okay, move on to bony injuries. Um, with bone imaging, MRI bone imaging, uh, if there is any clinical evidence of uh, bony injury, in our protocol, we have to have these two sequences. T1, which detects the fracture lines, and stair sequence detects the bony edema due to bony contusion. So these are your primary sequences for imaging any patient with suspected bone injury. The spectrum of injuries uh, ranges from bony contusion, uh, trabecular microfractures, to bony impaction, to stress fractures. This is how bony contusion looks like. And bony contusion is very helpful for us to um, 
predict what the mechanism of injury was. So for example, in this patient, because we see kissing anterior bony contusion involving the lateral femoral condyle and lateral tibial plateau, then we know this patient suffered the extension mechanism of injury. And because we know there's this hyperextension mechanism of injury, then we will be looking for ACL and PCL tears. So bony contusion is actually helpful for that. Uh, here is another example with laterally sided uh, bony contusion involving lateral femoral condyle and lateral tibial plateau. So just by looking at the pattern of bony contusion, you can actually predict that this patient suffered valgus mechanism of injury. And also you see here avulsion or bony avulsion of the medial femoral condyle because of that valgus mechanism of injury. Here is another pattern of bony contusion. Uh, and because of the distribution of the bony contusion, you can predict that this patient suffered bifid shift mechanism of injury. And uh, the contusion typically here happens in the lateral femoral condyle anterolaterally and posterolaterally in the uh, in the lateral tibial plateau. And on the sagittal T1, you see all these hypo intense areas at the sites of the bony contusion. Another pattern of bony injury is what we call trabecular microfractures. And these are the trabecular microfractures. And the best uh, sequence for, for detecting these trabecular microfractures is the T1 sequence. So on T1, we see hypo intense signal lines, which appear edematous on the fluid sensitive sequences. Another pattern of bony injury is bony impaction injury. And the best example for that is Helsac's lesion after anterior shoulder dislocation, which is demonstrated by focal area of bony concavity involving the uh, supralateral aspect of the humeral head. And in, uh, in our center, what we do when we have patients with Helsac's lesion, we measure the Helsac's lesion in the anteroposterior dimension, in the craniocaudal dimension, and also we measure the depth of the Helsac's lesion uh, because that determines whether the Helsac's lesion is engaging or non-engaging. Our orthopedic surgeons always ask for three-dimensional measurement of the Helsac's lesion. And last pattern of bony uh, injury is the stress fracture. And stress fracture presents as hypo-intense signal line, which is normally touching the cortex of the bone. And that's classically how stress fractures look like. Uh, on the coronal T1, for example, in the distal tibia, we see hypointense line touching the cortex associated with periosseal reaction here and surrounded by edema on the stair sequence. So this is uh, typically how stress fractures look like. And what we do in our practice is we advise for activity modification. So if this patient is a runner uh, or involved in, uh, uh, in competitive sports, uh, then we uh, advise the patient to uh, uh, undergo activity modification for three months and then repeat the MRI scan or repeat the radiographs and assess for any improvements. Okay, we're done with bone injuries, move on to apophysial injuries. Um, the best example for that is the apophysial injury of the uh, inferior pole of the patella, which is named as sending larsen johansen syndrome. Uh, which is traction apophysitis of the inferior pole of the patella. On radiographs, you would um, see some fragmentation of the inferior pole of the patella. On MRI scan, you see edema of the inferior pole of the patella, and sometimes you see proximal tendinosis of the patellar tendon. So this typically happens in um, patients who, um, uh, who are competitive basketball players because of the repetitive overuse of the extensor mechanism of the knee joint. And with the same mechanism of injury, repetitive overuse of the extensor mechanism, uh, you could also see oshkut slaughter disease, which is traction apophysitis of the uh, apophysis of the tibial tuberosity. Uh, so you see that again as edema, sometimes fragmentation of the apophysis of the uh, tibial tuberosity. So they're both the same, in the same spectrum of uh, injury. Another uh, traction apophysitis or apophysial injury is little leak elbow. I've had this case about two months ago. Uh, this is a baseball pitcher. And because of the repetitive valgus mechanism of injury, you get a lot of stress on the medial side of the elbow joint. And this leads to uh, 
traction apophysitis of the medial epicondyle. Um, bursal injuries, uh, we see bursal injuries in bursae that cover bony prominences, such as the allocronal bursa or prepatellar bursa. <clears throat> this is, for example, a patient who suffered posterior dislocation of the elbow joint, and we see here hemorrhagic bursitis of the allocron and bursa. Uh, so this is just how it looks like on MRI. So if you saw this on MRI, this is what really it is. <clears throat> Lastly, fascial injuries. Um, the best example for fascial injuries is moral lavely. Uh, and moral lavely is degloving injury that happens between the subcutaneous fat and the deep fascia of the lateral aspect of the thigh. So this happens when patient fall during motion. Uh, so uh, when, when that happens, then you get shear injury or degloving injury between the subcutaneous fat and the deep fascia. And this results with um, a deep uh, cavity, fluid felt cavity. And another characteristic appearance for this pathology is these fat lobules. And these fat lobules represent fat necrosis due to uh, uh, subcutaneous fat contusion. So this is how fat necrosis really looks like after trauma. And moral levely is uh, self-limiting um, in uh, pathology. There's no need for intervention. Normally it will resolve on its own. Okay, so that's the end. Um, in summary, uh, this talk aimed to provide some practical tip about MRI imaging. Uh, we talked about the scanners, the cause, positioning, sequences, advantages and disadvantages of um, each sequence, um, artifacts, common artifacts we encounter with MRI. Remember that magic and the effect is not uh, a problem limited to the tendons, but you can also see it with parallel fibrous muscles such as the thinar muscles or uh, palmaris quadratus uh, muscle. <clears throat> we talked about basic definition and terminology of some of the musculoskeletal injuries such as ellipse lesion, parathase lesion, bankart lesion. Um, I always go back to my basics. If I see something on MRI, I go back to my definitions and remember what each definition means or the pathology, how the pathology should be interpreted. Um, we also provided a pictorial review of common sports injuries related to different tissue pathology, muscles, tendons, and so on and so forth. Um, the aim for the pictorial review was to provide with um, description uh, of the pathology and the changes, the characteristic MRI appearances for each pathology. Um, remember your anatomy for muscle tears uh, because that is really important for compartmental anatomy and detecting which muscle is involved. Um, quantifying uh, soft tissue injuries, uh, such as quantifying ligamentous injuries, quantifying muscle tears can be quite valuable for the orthopedic surgeons. So this is the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening and I would love to uh, hear your questions.